Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to see you all here. My name is Yasmin Hassan Food. Thanks for the nice introduction. I work mostly on physical layer and Mac layer uh, at higher frequencies that we can see software has to be. Okay, so a lot of emerging applications. I have a few examples here. Use gigabit per second to scale data rate and require uh, very low latency. Autonomous cars expected to generate four terabytes of data per day. We have virtual reality screen that require gigabit per second to scale data rate and need to the scale latency. We also have various wireless sensing uh, applications, which is the human robot interactions that require high precision in order of millimeter rate or even soft millimeter rate accuracy. We're talking about uh, remote surgery, for example. Unfortunately, today's wireless technology cannot support the data rate and latency required to support these very few applications. To tackle this and like kind of support these data rates, we have to look into higher frequencies. Uh, so this is like where today's Wi-Fi and LTE operate. We all know, I don't need to explain to this community that we have 14 gigahertz of available bandwidth in the 6 gigahertz band alone. And if you look even further above 100 gigahertz, we have much more available spectrum. So having gigahertz of scale bandwidth can naturally translate to gigabit per second scale data rate in principle. And 6G will be featuring terahertz frequency or soft terahertz frequency network. I will use these terms and, uh, interchangeably. Like what I mean is above 100 gigahertz. Okay, so but what are the fundamental challenges of these higher frequencies? Well, one very uh, like fundamental one is we have higher penetration and we have higher propagation loss. So we have to use directional beams uh, instead of omnidirectional patches, right? So that's the first step. Now, how do we create these directional beams and how are we going to steer them in real time? That's the number one challenge. The second challenge is uh, susceptibility to blockage. Most of uh, like our everyday objects can actually absorb this software hash signal and cause link failure. Well, traditionally at lower frequencies, we rely a lot on like multi-paths, right? But one question is how much actually we can rely on this non-line of sight path as we go to about 100 gigahertz, ambient non-line of sight path. Now, if the ambient non-line of sight path does not exist, can we come up with artificial paths, right? For example, using a smart surfaces that has been a hot topic. And fundamentally, uh, the power consumption is a big deal at the higher frequencies, right? So this even installed uh, the uh, the progress of 5G in the millimeter wave band because the battery is just going to be a constraint here. And there have been a lot of studies showing that yes, you get gigabit per second of same data rate. But as soon as your uh, device hits up, you lose your rate quite abruptly. So then if you go to higher frequencies, like about 100 gigahertz would actually become a, a worse problem. So how do we solve that at higher frequencies? So in this talk, I will uh, try to sort of give, give you my ideas on the three very fundamental problems and tell you what we're doing in my lab uh, to kind of solve these challenges. I will uh, first talk about a novel frequency controlled beam steering uh, for software edge network. Then I'll talk about the single charm beam coordination and mobility management that's on the Mac layer. And uh, I'll talk about the new architecture for power efficient software edge communication. And at the end, I'll um, quickly mention some of the new security, wireless security paradigms in this high frequency. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, well, traditionally, we create directional beam using phase edge. Which means that you put different phase shifts on, on top of the antenna element, and these phases help you have these signals that are emitting from each antenna add up constructively at the angle that you Unfortunately, scaling the same strategy to terahertz is not possible because of heat dissipation and because of efficiency, especially if you want to deal with gigahertz scale bands. Okay. Then we ask this question of what can we do? What's, the, what's another way of solving this problem? We want a directional beam. Well, we have a lot of in this high frequency is bandwidth. Why not use bandwidth as a modality to do, to do beam estimate, to create directional beam? So we worked in this new architecture, a new antenna design called Wiki Data. So uh, it's nothing like fancy. Like here, two pieces of metal put in parallel. There's a slit open on one end. This is a slit that you can see. 
the plate separation here, I know that I'm B, it's about one millimeter, you can play with it a little bit. Uh, and it, so this is a traveling data structure for those of you who are uh, coming from the physics side of it. So you, you inject the signal in, it interacts with, um, with the air, with the open air, and uh, through this open air and it will leak out. But interestingly, it will leak out at a particular angle. And that angle is a function of frequency. So I'm not gonna go to the physics of it, but if you write the full component inside the wavelength and you create space, and then based on the Maxwell, based on the boundary condition, solve uh, basically the boundary condition on this open aperture with some uh, math, uh, math here, you can realize that the angle phi f, the angle of emission is related to the frequency of the signal. So it's sine inverse of the speed of light over 2bf, b is the plate separation and it is the frequency, okay? So it's very cool, right? So it's, if you inject a different frequency in, it will end up a different uh, angle. So it's a beam study that is controlled with frequency for the first time. So let's just uh, take a look at this equation. <laughs> so here I'm showing the angle phi of f as a function of frequency or y. First, note that this is the scale step. So the, the, the lowest uh, frequency is 150 gigahertz. And it goes all the way to 800 gigahertz. So, and you support all of this wide band with just one single length, right? And it's direction. It's very cool. So you can you can ask that how do you tune that? Well, you can actually tune these cutoff frequencies by uh, by choosing the geometry of the waveguide, for example, the place. So now you can also use this for multiplexing. So if I inject two tones in, I get two tones out at the same time at two different angles. So if I have a user here operating at F blue here at F green, I can support them simultaneously uh, with this one single antenna. Yeah. So also you can see higher frequencies I need at lower angle and what. Now this device is passive, it's cheap, it's light. You can put it on your handheld device, you can put it on the, on the access point side. So my colleague at Princeton actually taped out this using CMOS. So even though I showed the bulky waveguide, you can actually make this much more tiny and scalable uh, by fabricating it with the CMOS. So this is what you can see, one millimeter by kilometer. These are two waveguides. You can see there are multiple streets here, and it's not only one street. So there's a lot of room. The, the design space is really huge. Okay. So now, what do we have so far? We have a frequency controlled beam and tuning. So depending on where our user is, we have to choose the right frequency to point our beam to our targets, right? You can also uh, control the beam width of your pattern by controlling the band width of the scene. So it's the first time your band width and beam width are called. Okay. Um, again, like the equations that I showed was like really the, 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 an ideal simple where you just look at the peak <coughs> angle as a function of frequency. You can actually model the whole radiation pattern as a function of frequency. And that's how it looks like. So beta here is the frequency dependent propagation constant. Alpha basically models the loss factor inside the waveguide and L is the length of uh, this is big. So B here is in the beta. So, two factors in the geometry that matters in this equation is L and B. So there are some ongoing work. So the problem here is this coupling between angle and frequency is just fixed. Once you produce the antenna, once you fabricate the antenna, this equation is fixed. There's nothing that you can change, meaning that this F always comes out at this angle. So if your user happens to not operate at that frequency, then you have a problem, right? And having uh, ultra wideband receivers, well, that is a, also a challenge because that's more complexity, higher power consumption, right? So uh, ideally, you want to be able to control this angle frequency uh, relationship, reconfigure it based on the user density and based on the needs of each application and each use. So we are actually working on um, this idea right now. It's an A4 funded project. We are trying to come up with novel multi liquid wave and non multi s -lead architecture. We're also augmenting the back plate here with a smart surface that to change beta uh, in that equation that I showed you, electron, and with that, control the angle frequency. 
So if we can achieve that right now, so if I want to communicate to these uh, three users, I can only communi communicate F1. But there's a relationship between F1, F2, F3, and the angle, right? So we can also say the theme band is versus limit. I can only choose soft bands here in this frame. But if I'm able to do that, then I can actually um, very dynamically choose which subman goes to which frame. And it can have a lot of applications for cellular and I have to emphasize that you can actually create the same thing at lower frequencies, even 60 gigahertz regime, even actually at lower microwave bands. And there are um, any papers out there that do that. But the need for doing such something like that in higher frequencies is actually much more uh, intense because they said, as I said, cannot scale them to these higher frequencies. But you can actually use similar ideas as well. Okay. So I talked about the physical layer. So I gave you an idea on how to do efficient frequency control beam scanning in the physical layer. Now, the question is, how do users find each other? How do they pinpoint the beams toward each other in an efficient, scalable, real time, right? So let's look it into, let's look into IEEE 811 AB and AY. We got 60 gigahertz, that's the closest to the uh, software heads that we have. Uh, standard wide right now. So let's look into this standard and see how this is being handled right now. The answer is, well, it's the most naive way that you can imagine. So basically the idea is you sweep through different beam directions, you receive the SNR power across beam ID, so each beam has an ID, and then you log into the beam that gives you the highest SNR, then you sometimes repeat it on the receive side, depending on the directionality that you need. And then you log into the best beam direction. Uh, if it's mobile, then you have to keep repeating um, the, the same procedure when you do the beam, right? Uh, the problem with this is that you need order of n transmission, even if one side is only direction and the other one is only direction. There are ways to reduce that to order of log n, the happens can work out there, but it's still it's a huge number. It's a huge number of uh, transmissions that you have to do. And you have to repeat it on your mobile. Now, if we just gave the same idea to South Terahertz, well, we cannot do omnidirectional reception because you actually need the directionality on the receiver. You have much more beams at the transmit side. The N actually goes up, right? And you are much more sensitive to uh, mobility, orientation, translation. These are actually real data that are collected in the lab. These are 200 right? And you can see that the small rotation, the small movement, this is in centimeter scale, how much dB you lose in the signal. Okay. So instead of doing this uh, trial and error based uh, uh, sort of uh, beam discovery, we thought about how can we do this more efficiently and ideally with one single transmission, one single transmission. Well, we know that in this high frequency, the challenge is spot. So we have line of light and first order reflections. Because of the high reflection loss, you probably don't see a lot of second order. So you have a very few paths to track. So if I can identify these paths and track them, then my problem is solved because I can then go into the beam, the line of light beam. Uh, without any scanning, and also if I lose my line of flight direction, I have a backup path that can just look into the number. Our key idea is to send different spectral signatures in each angle. And like, for example, in this uh, picture that I'm showing here, uh, because there's a relationship between angle of departure and frequency, if I just measure power across the spectrum, at my receiver, no phase, nothing fancy, just power detector across different uh, frequencies. I can actually uh, figure out I see better thing like at four and five, and if I know the one to one map between frequency and angle of departure, I know where these angles are, I know where these paths are. Okay. Uh, you can guess by now that I'm going to use Wiki Valence to not solve this problem. That's the perfect case, right? So I he said, why, why not using leaky wave antenna to um, in the terrorist control? Okay. So instead of sending a single tone, what I'll do is I'll send the terahertz pulse. In frequency domain, it's just a wide band signal. I send the pulse in, it creates uh, some, something like a rainbow, an, an invisible rainbow on the output because every frequency will leak out at a different angle. 
right? So on the receive side, on the receive side, it can, I can have a normal detector or I can have a leaky wave antenna. It really doesn't matter. At the end, I look at which color or which frequency do I receive and map that back to angle of departure. This is one single transition, right? If I have a non-line of sight path, I'll get two tones. So I can actually recover um, my non-line of sight path from taking my uh, It involves one-shot transmission. I'm using only one single antenna. And this is scalable because if I have multiple receivers, they can all simultaneously uh, receive different spectral signatures and map them back to um, scalable with regard to number of receivers. So we did a lot of work in this uh, domain. This is published in Nature Com. So if you're interested, uh, please take a look at the paper. But the idea is uh, the G function that I showed you, you can model G as a function of phi here and basically look into the signal propagation in the wireless medium with sleep signal is a function of the G and alpha. Alpha is the complex uh, channel gain corresponding to each path, and capital P is the total number of paths that, that you see in the medium. And um, you can look at the total covered spectrum and then form an uh, optimization framework looking into basically n different subbands or n different subcarriers and try to find angles which match or give you the least error compared to your model. This is not coherent because I am looking only into cover and there is no need to train in advance. So you can basically put this device into any room and this will work. So it's not like fingerprinting or all those um, training heavy things. Okay. okay, so comparing this to uh, the traditional like uh, trial and error ITP plate called 11 AY, but here you're sending a unique beam ID in each direction. Here you're sending a spectral of signature at each angle. There you have to try one view at a time. So you're trying all directions once here. And the training time, depending on how many beams uh, you have, can, can take about 10 to 100 microseconds here. It's in the order of nanoseconds because you're just sending a pod. That's it. So much more uh, efficient. We did test this with a uh, hardware in, in my lab. So this is our terahertz pulse port. This is the, this, um, the time domain signal and frequency domain signal. It's not like flat flat, but it's like flat from 100 to 300 uh, gigahertz in, in the case. Uh, and so we have a broadband detector here. The quality is not really good here, but you can see the line of sight and non-line of sight path. This is our custom receiver antenna. The range is here. Uh, like top table, and the reason for that is that the output power of this source is minus uh, 10 dBm across uh, five terahertz of the spectrum. So, per like if you're just looking into this band, uh, I don't have the number on top of my head, but this is really small. So, so you're emitting a small amount of power, and that's why your range is <clears throat> small. And nothing on the physics of the problem would change if you just increase your output power so you can get to uh, larger distances. Indeed, like in a different experiment, we showed that you can reach on uh, until three meters with the same setup, with the same output power. Okay, so uh, just showing one result on the uh, line of flight and non-line of flight uh, uh, estimation accuracy. Uh, this is in with one, uh, this is one antenna, and this is with one transmission, so no average over time. So because in principle, you can take average across time and reduce your uh, node. So they're not doing all of those things. It's just one single transmission. And line of sight error is like 1.1 degree. Non-line of sight is about 2 degree. Uh, this can significantly go down. And we showed that in our other papers that you can get to sub degree. Uh, but you require either multiple sleep or you require to do averaging over time to Basically, your SMR is low, so you have to uh, get rid of noise somehow. Okay. Uh, I also want to share some interesting, like one interesting result that is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, we know that the non-line of sight paths are much weaker in the subterranean regime, but uh, the nice thing about this leaky wave antenna is that your bandwidth is a nonlinear function of your frequency as well, and also nonlinear function of your angle. So here, what I'm showing is. I normalize the bandwidth that I get across a non-line of sight path, normalizing it to a line of sight angle that is fixed at 45 degrees. 
which is in tier one at 45. And you can see for the for smaller angle, I get much better bandwidth. So this is in the order of different, different uh, relatives. So there's no, uh, but but basically you can see that like in this angle, you get twice bandwidth of 45 degrees. So if your non-line of size happens to be at lower angle compared to line of size path, you get much better bandwidth, even though your SNR is lower at that angle, your bandwidth can potentially be higher. So we did an analysis, uh, but this is empirical data. So we said like if our non-line of size is let's say 3 dB lower in SNR or six or nine, how much would be the data rate that we get compared to the line of sight path? So because the bandwidth is higher, even though if your SNR is lower, you can actually potentially get higher data rate across your non-line of sight path. And here is where you can see that depending on which curve you're looking at, at certain angles you are above this. Region. So this is the difference of non-line of sight path between line of sight path. It is very counterintuitive. Okay. So, so far I talked about just the physical layer and Mac layer of it. Just want to spend maybe one or two slides on potentially using the same device for sensing. So I'm, I'm sure what I'm showing here is that, that if you look into the raw data that we get across time, you can potentially do blockage sensing and mobility tracking together. How to do how to do the mobility, how to do blockage sensing between the cause is not good. But if you put an object in front of the rainbow, it will block certain frequencies, right? But the frequency that it will block is correlated with the geometry of the object and also its location. So you have different frequencies at different angles, right? So you can you can do blockage sensing or environmental sensing with that. Uh, actually, we showed that you can do orientation sensing with this device as well. So I, if I look at my uh, liquidate antenna as a receiver. Just like transmission, where you have a one on one relationship between angle and frequency, you have the same uh, reciprocal behavior in the receiver. So let's say I'm sending this band and then coupling perfectly because it's hitting at the right angle. As soon as I rotate this, then some portion of the frequency is just not going to go in. So this is the result. So this is like this blue here is under perfect alignment. And you see, as I keep rotating it, the band is going to move toward higher frequencies. So I can actually figure out the amount of rotation as well as the direction of rotation here clockwise by just looking at the changes in the band that I'm seeing over time. So if it was counterclockwise, you'll see shift toward lower uh, band. Okay. We also did a recent work which was uh, presented in Mobicom this year. I'm trying to extending this idea from 2D to 3D. Um, so we are using two or orthogonal space and two different polarization thing and it out <clears throat> at the same time. So you can separate the signal and get from two to Okay. So, so far I talked about the first two bullet points, the frequency control beam scanning and the finger shot beam coordination. I'm going to use the same principle, the same architecture for power efficient terahertz uh, communication. So as I said, the power consumption is a big deal for higher frequency. A portion of it is coming from just the circuitry of signal generation and amplification, and that is more power demanding. And a different portion of it is coming from the fact that we need large antenna arrays at these high frequencies, and that is complex in power. power. So the key idea is, why not use the back scattering that we know at lower frequencies to get rid of the first part, for the second part, we need to come up with a novel sort of retro directive design so that you can achieve directionality without putting large antenna in, right? Uh, well, yes, you can think about it like that, but having this at higher frequencies, like having a back scattering at has not been done before because it's just so challenging. The loss is so much higher and we don't have a good design architecture to, to, to do that. So. You have, you have two requirements for having back scale that's up there. Well, it, whatever architecture you have needs to support wide bands of operation. So we have like a lower band at millimeter rate, for example, you have Vanna Kali, uh, we are familiar with that. Um, it uses a transmission line and transmission line is narrow. So if you do a wide band transmission with that structure, you'll see beam all over the place. So it may not actually operate at this wide band anyway. 
Uh, and you also need to do virtual transmission and reception, but without consuming power. So we uh, have a paper coming up in SDI 2023 called Leaky Scatter, which is when the first terahertz packet scatter architecture. Okay, so let me, let me tell you about the, the idea here. Uh, as I uh, just talked about, we have a reciprocal pattern at the transmit and receiving. So if uh, looking at the transmit mode, if you change the frequency at the emitter, you get different angles. Here, if you actually change your frequency, the only frequency that will go to the detector is the frequency that is intending at the right angle. Okay. And these are the measurement results that we're showing. You'll see the pattern. So the color is for different frequencies or different angles, but then um, the, the, the two curves showing the transmission and reception. You can see that they, they match to some extent. So we use this principle to design a uh, double slit retro directed node. So the idea is simple to have two slits that are in parallel to each other. One of them is accepting the waves, the other one is radiating the waves back to the next. So you get the waves, you put two mirrors inside to redirect the terahertz wave toward the second uh, slit. And then because it's the same frequency, it has to go out to the same angle. So you basically radiate the signal back to the direction of the transmitter. You have a transceiver now, just like an RFID reader, and you have a backscatter pack that operates at terahertz, at soft terahertz. Okay, so this is zero power cost, um, and uh, you get the retrogractivity without consuming any power. But we haven't embedded data immediately, just to get the same signal, we get the signal and send it back to the same direction. You have to find a way to modulate your data on top of it. And that's still uh, a challenge. Like having terahertz modulators is, is an open problem. There's still a lot of research going on in this region. But we, just to show a prototype, we uh, looked into two uh, potential ways. I'm just talk about one of them for the sake of uh, time today. What we are using is a micro MEMS mirror. So replacing one of the fixed mirrors with uh, the uh, micro MEMS. I have a picture of that in the next slide. So you get the signal and you basically modulate the trajectory of the wave inside the wave cut. You've got the heat map inside the wave cut in, in two different um, uh, orientations of the main mirror. So when you are rotating your mirror inside the wave guide, you control how much of the power that you got actually sees the second state and goes up. So you basically do aperture modulation for your second state by rotating. Uh, the problem is it's slow because it's the memory mirror. So we are looking into doing it electronically again by uh, uh, metal surfaces on the back. Right? But that work is uh, still ongoing. So this is the structure. So these are two slits. You can uh, you can see that the shape is not rectangular anymore. The, the reason for that is for maximizing the coupling, e coupling efficiency um, of the waveguide. So this is our MEMS mirror here. You can see it's uh, uh, so the mirror itself is four millimeter by uh, so it's a circle for four millimeter of diameter. And so this, this is our transmitter, and it's coating in to basically modulate the signal inside and emits out the same angle. So we first uh, confirmed that it's actually retro directed. So what I'm showing here is this is the receiver and uh, detector's angle versus a uh, different transmit angle. And you can also see that they're here. So the angle of emission and angle of reception matches its like fall on y equal x uh, curve. There are some discrepancies at that, but overall, uh, the angle that it transmits, you get it back at the same angle. Uh, we also showed that this is a good design uh, for scaling the number of packs to. Uh, potentially tens uh, of nodes at the same time because you basically different tag modulate uh, its signal on different subbands, right? So you can have a one wide band detector and figure out like the, the information that multiple tags are sending at the same time. And this is also bringing a lot of opportunities for joint communication and sensing because the band at which you receive the signal tells you information about the location of the tag and the actual modulation happening within that band it can be in amplitude, it can be in phase, but within that band, you have your data. So this is, this is an interesting uh, joint communication and sensing. 
Okay. So last but not least, I want to spend a few minutes on wireless security because uh, you probably hear this a lot, like this myth about TeraHash that yes, it's frictional, it's going to be secure. Why are you talking about wireless security in this higher frequency? Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Yes, the beams are directional, but I just talked about the scanning process that happens before that, right? That scanning process is not directional, it's like, like either looking into all directions or it's quasi on it, so uh, that can be manipulated. Uh, for blockage recovery, there has been a lot of new infrastructure being introduced to the network. For example, smart surfaces or reconfigurable surfaces. They, they give you basically a new opportunity for manipulating the wireless medium on demand and, and kind of attacking the devices or the transmitters. Also, this is the first time that uh, you need to know the lo location of the device in order to communicate it. So it creates a lot of privacy because without knowing the location, you cannot talk to it. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting work happening at the intersection of privacy and communication. Uh, but I just want to zoom in into the second bullet again because of the time. Uh, so smart surfaces, if you're not familiar with them, uh, uh, are being introduced for various purposes, but in higher frequencies mainly because they give you a non-reconfigurable non-line of sight path to do blockage recovery. And it has a lot of applications. So if you can, uh, you can have multiple of them because they're scalable and low cost. Uh, you can do sensing on the surface. That's an ongoing project, uh, and it's a rings project that we have. Or you can do it, uh, upload the sensing information on the access point side. Uh, you can actually think about indoor to outdoor coverage, cellular or satellite. This is also a, a recent paper in Hotnet's a collaboration with my colleague, Kyle Jamson. So we are here proposing a, a dual band Huygens surfaces for a KU band for satellite communication. So it basically converts and steers the signal satellite signal uh, in both reflection and transmission mode to so get rid of the dish altogether. So, so there's a lot of applications, right? Uh, but what I want to talk about now is the security of these metasets. Because these are low cost, these are scalable, and it's not like there's no central controller necessarily. So it's a, it's a perfect position for an attacker to manipulate this and manipulate your waveform, manipulate your channel. Um, there are a lot of work again here. So you can break the reciprocity, for example, of uplink and downlink. You can uh, steal the beam away from your legitimate client and do denial, denial of service attack, for example. The, the attack that I'm, I'm proposing here is a little bit more sophisticated. So here we assume that you can actually control the delay. So each of these, each of these columns are controlled with a BIOS line, with a control line, right? So to set different phases across different elements. But you can also control the delay among this, so the delay relative to each column, right? So you can do space-time coding in this design. And with that, uh, we showed that you can create a sideband with slightly different frequency, uh, and it's still it, and it's still it to any angle that you want. So let's say access point is talking to Bob. There's a blockage. They're they're using the surface for communication now. So send signal in. Bob getting its signal at the same frequency. It's happy, but then you actually create a sideband and steer it to Bob Mary wherever she is. You actually don't care about the location, and then being able to recover the same signal at <clears throat> Mali. You see a hit in the box cover, yes, but the amount of hit that you see, that is also controlled. I'll show that later on. The duty cycle of the control signal uh, defines the relative cover distribution between these two parts. So you can also control that. We actually have 3D power fluctuation in millimeter wave band anyway. So if you can, Put it around 3 dB, the user cannot say if it's coming because it's under attack, it's coming because the channel is just uh, fluctuating because of mobile. Uh, so, uh, in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Kashik Singhupta, we actually picked out a chip. Uh, it's an active surface. Uh, you can see uh, the layout of LNA phase shift and amplifier. And uh, it's an eight element antenna, so it's not really big right now, but it's, it's good for just prototyping the idea. Uh, and 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 we 
we did experiments in our lab and <clears throat> I just show two results here. So um, here the green band is uh, intended for dog and blue band is intended for mallet. And you can see that we can see the, the blue band independent of the green band. Uh, this, is, this is interesting because you don't need to rely on opportunistic eavesdropping, which is basically eavesdropping through side loop in this higher frequency. You don't care about where your malady is located at. You can always guarantee a good signal at malady. I also here showing that I also show here that the, the ratio of the power that you see is controllable. So you can, if your channel is really good at Bob, let's say Bob is really close to the surface. So you don't really need much of SNR there. You can put more power to malady. But if your malady has multiple antenna, it doesn't need that much of power. You can put more power to Bob. So there's always this trade-off of performance versus filthiness, right? So if you see higher drop at, at Bob, you kind of see, okay, what's well, something is wrong. So you always have to deal with that trade-off according to the channel uh, and the location. And that is uh, possible with changing the beams. Okay. Oops. So at the end, um, this may be a quick um, uh, sort of summary of what we discussed. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting open problems in this higher frequency band. Uh, you have a new design of space. Uh, you basically design your physical and material from a scratch. Uh, and, 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 and it's very exciting. There's also a lot of important cross-cutting cross topics like security and resilience in these higher frequencies that we have to deal with. Uh, at the end, I want to thank our collaborators at Brown, North System, Princeton, Intel, and Microsoft Research, and also uh, all the credit goes to my students uh, for their hard with me. Our group is a small, and that's also the entire group, uh, but um, but they're really uh, doing a great job and uh, uh, doing their research. Uh, thanks so much. We have time for a couple of questions. Hi, um, very interesting talk. I want to ask you about the commercialization mm -hmm. potential and how you see getting this technology out into the market. Is, is it through licensing to some of your collaboration partners or doing a startup company? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I really both of them. So mm -hmm. uh, we are working on, as, as, as I showed in one of the chips, so we are trying to show to the industry that look, this can be manufactured at larger scale and, and it's not that much different from the phase they architecture, but there's a long way to go because you have to show them at different frequencies and do a lot of testing. Uh, some of it is actually not research problem, uh, a most engineering problem. That's why we're not doing it in our lab. So we would love to collaborate with people in the industry who are interested in this project. Uh, the startup, yes. So I think there is potential to start, and there's a lot of companies out there, startups that do millimeter wave delay, for example, millimeter wave arrays in general. They, we don't have that much happening in software as yet, but I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, a uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. I just have a very basic question. So, in let's say you have a, a signal of 500 megahertz uh, there going in, and as it gets out, do all the, uh, uh, the frequencies going to come at a different angle? Yeah. Now, is, it, is this angle linear? And what happens on the other side when you do the reverse? Is that, are there any distortions of the frequency from the both side? That's and the other one, what's kind of the, uh, is the power, it's the second has high power. Do you have any, any longevity through the thing yeah. from that to end? Yeah, that, those are very great questions. Actually, everything about this device is non-linear okay. because the angle frequency relationship is non-linear, right? That's why bandwidth is non-linear. Bandwidth is just a bit of frequency, right? That also, uh, that's also non uh, which makes it interesting because you can potentially support different uh, bands at different angles with different, like depending on the application, right? Right now, the issue is that that angle frequency, that nonlinearity is fixed. So you always get better bandwidth at smaller angles. You always get higher carrier frequency at a small angle, right? Uh, a small angle here means like maybe 20 meter degree all the way to 40 degree, you can support 60, 70 gigahertz of bandwidth, and your carrier frequency is above uh, 300 gigahertz, right? But you can always play with it. Again, that's a function of the geometry of the data. 
So if you want that to be 200, you have to do that. Uh, it's just a matter of how 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 do you design antenna? It's kind of the same as any antenna that you design. Yeah. You regularly frequency all the function of the geometry of the antenna. It's the same here, uh, but you have different um, uh, parameters to play with here. The design space is different, but it's doable. Uh, the liquid wave antenna, the idea is not new. It goes back to 1940, yeah. right? But no one has actually ever used it in the context of communication and sensing in the kind of system. So uh, we have a lot of information from physics to use and build this system. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff up there. I'm just wondering if you or your team have had a chance to look into some of the ways of reprogramming those smart surfaces. Yeah. You know, in the event of um, N-loss detecting blockage or perhaps detecting suspicious activity. Yeah. Have. You're talking about the security uh, factors that I'm talking about? Well, the security and also in the event of if there's nothing yeah. malicious, there's a blockage, there's. Yeah, there's... Yeah, yeah. So we're uh, uh, depending on the thing. So the Huygens surface, uh, the reactor, it's a passive surface. So typically, we either use reactors or LC, or the case is uh, Reactors also, I mean, if you are at the frequency range that you can use reactors, of course, it's better. But sometimes there's a like a technology limit on, on uh, the operation of the reactor, so that's kind of an issue. Uh, in millimeter wave band, that's much more comprehensive in the sense that it could amplifier in it, so we can afford to lose some cover in our modulator or in our space shifting strategy. So short answer is that most of the purposes that I showed, they are reconfigurable, and you can control the phase, and the set phase, the whole you can control phase and gain in the Thank you. So the power goes up because the data rate goes up. So are there fundamentals that make the energy per bit go up also? Other than attenuation and error, of course. Uh, I mean, if you think about the calm theory aspects of it, I don't think so. But the technology aspect of it, I think it's about like, uh, like the ABC side is becoming more power hungry. Uh, every component in your RF chain becomes more power hungry, and that's giving you higher uh, energy per bit, not necessarily. That's more engineering. That's, that's just engineering. Yes. What's the problem? Yes. But okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should. Just yeah. engineering. That's just a physicist. Yeah, yes, exactly. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are the characteristics of the phase family and those frequencies? Are there any correlations to the frequencies? Very great question. Actually, we have a project right now uh, that I didn't talk about, which looks into uh, the new channel characteristics of terahertz. Uh, one very interesting one is that the surfaces, even the ambient surfaces that you have, might not be smooth anymore. They become rough. Which means that um, you cannot just rely on a snail law anymore, like the angle of incident is not a perfect angle of perfection. You might have a scattering, diffusion, like or a combination of that. Uh, it's interesting because these ambient surfaces sometimes uh, can actually give you non line of sight path at non specular angle because of the roughness. You do not think it's not certain. But that happens randomly. So, I mean, I don't know if you can rely on that uh, for coverage. But if you're just looking at the coverage heat map in this room, if you're just looking at okay, every second is smooth, you get uh, sparks, you get a lot of blockage hole. But if all surfaces are rough, you get a lot of scattering. So there's, there's a higher chance of covering the whole uh, room just be down the inside. And we're trying to figure out uh, what's the percentage and what would be uh, even like we don't know if, I mean, we just know that concrete, for example, or unfinished wood is considered rough at these frequencies and polished metal and polished wood can be a but that's kind of the state of the art that we don't know uh, but other than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, very interesting talk, so thanks a lot. Yeah, I was wondering if you, if you can comment on the sort of deployment sort of options here or the visibility of the yeah. space. I mean, I, I looked at the leak wave antenna and it looked like a, no, I don't know. Yeah. Like this side, and can you shrink it? Yeah, so it's kind of like the cut that I showed is just for measurement in the lab because we cannot tape out every single idea. 
but you can design this at much uh, uh, larger scale and uh, tiny form factor if you just use C. Uh, because it's a, it was two pieces of metal. I can't have metal and ground plate. The substrate is going to be low enough because substrate will, will lose a lot. Of, you, you lose a lot of energy because of the substrate. So here in our base guide, it's air, right? You cannot put air, of course, there, but you have to come up with a low enough substrate there. Uh, it does not attenuate the system. But it's feasible. And as I showed one, one of the uh, my colleague, Kasha saying this out of ISCPC paper, uh, that just fabricated the way down and tested the Venus scanning part uh, about 100 meters. 